Good morning, on this afternoon, right? So I think um, one of the things how I want to try to frame this is this is about predatory behavior, right? I think regardless of how we look at hackers, serial killers, uh, child offenders, we're talking about predatory behavior. So all the, you know, I, I went to Black Hat a month ago, a month and a half ago, six weeks ago now, and I walk in, and I think I know something about the industry. Even yesterday, going through some of these presentations of the, the caliber of speakers, I think I know something about the industry. And I walk in and go, oh my God, how does anybody make sense of, sense of all this, right? So what I want to try to do today is give you at least some concepts based on my experience with the profiling unit, the behavioral analysis unit, and the behavioral science unit. I'll go into that in another difference. Uh, as to how maybe to wrap your hands around this. So um, I'm a big believer in different schemas, like different brains work different ways, and if attack chain and, and security stack work for you, it's great. Um, but maybe there's some things from, from the profiling expertise or discipline that can, that can help you out as well. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to try to turn you into uh, profilers in 45 minutes. There's a lot of stuff we don't get a chance to talk about today. One is going to be content analysis, looking at language, we'll touch on it briefly. How that, might, how that might help. Online behavior when it comes to uh, when you actually go to figure out how are people different, how can I profile someone from a behavioral perspective, right? One of the things you better look at is how do we all act online, right? How does, how does behavior change all of us as opposed to just the bad guy? Because you got to start from there, right? So but we, don't, we don't get a chance to get into that. Um, maybe next year we will. Um, I had a research project also that went out and interviewed hackers. Um, I wish I had, had the time and energy and, and, and keep them in jail long enough to, to actually talk to them, because by the time you figure out where they are, they're, they're out a, you know, a year and a half later. So we could also talk about a lot of the research on behavior, right? How they are, what the personality they are, what, what's their makeup, are they different? You know, in fact, they're predominantly male, not all, they're predominantly male, right? There's a lot of theories out there. So we're not going to get a chance to go into a lot of that stuff, but we'll try to touch on a lot of different things. So a little bit about me, I, 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 if you were here yesterday, I mean, a lot of people didn't, so I won't necessarily refer to that uh, conversation, but I was in the FBI for 20 years. Before that, I was a fighter pilot in the Navy. I worked in Wall Street for two years. Um, while I was at the F, in the FBI, I started out doing terrorism. Uh, working terrorism, terrorism uh, targets in uh, New York. I did some cyber intrusion there. And then in 2004, I put in to go down to the behavioral analysis unit in Quantico. And I was there for six years, and then I went to BSU, the behavioral science unit, for two years. So what's the difference? Because this gets misconstrued. Um, after Waco, 1993, 1994-ish time period, 1995, in the, in the hearings that were after Waco, one of the things they came up with was, which was a great organizational type, uh, uh, type of estimate in itself, was we needed to, to take some of the profilers out of the behavioral science unit and have them reporting to the same management system that the hostage rescue team was in, that the hostage negotiators uh, actually uh, were in that, that management hierarchy. And that's how the BAU was started, the behavioral analysis unit. Um, the qualifications for going to both were a little, were a little different. Uh, you had to have a graduate degree to go to BSU. I have, went back to school and got a master's in forensic psychology. Um, but to become a profiler at the BAU, you, you just have to start out being a, I'll say, a relatively good investigator uh, for six to eight years in the FBI, and then you, then you apply. When you get down there for 16 weeks, they put you through their in-service training. You spend a week in a ward. Um, you uh, learn a lot about a lot of different things um, uh, about looking at a crime scene. You, it's a condensed psychology class they put you through. Because what a profiler is trying to do, right, is look at a crime scene, or in this case an intrusion, and assess personality. Right? Trying to assess personality. Now law enforcement is a little different, right? Why is law enforcement? The reason personality, personality might not mean anything to a lot of these people in this room, and I, I understand that, right? But I just want to catch the guy. But for law enforcement and intelligence, uh, I know you're out there somewhere. We're going to get a chance to talk to maybe some of these guys in the battlefield. 
right? You want to try to figure out what makes them tick personality-wise so you can interview them, right? That's, that's the bottom line. But when it comes to organizations such as, your, you know, normal organizations, you might not interview a lot of the attackers, the APT that, we, that, are, that are out to get you. But one of the areas where you will is the insider, right? We all have the insider problem, and you're probably, if anybody's in here in human resources, but that type of thing, you're, you're gonna have the chance to manage, right? Manage the situation, and if we get time, we'll talk about that a little bit. So understanding personality, personality types, is gonna help you. And the other thing is, I think it's just, we're all, we're all very interested in it, right? We're all very interested in why, what makes hackers different, or are they different? Paramount question: Are they different than 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 us? So, and then after uh, six years at BAU, I was invited to go to BSU and create a course on online behavior, and a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about here today. Um, and I did that at uh, BSU as well as what the behavioral science unit does is teach new agents. So I got to teach new agents and focus on research. And then we have a national academy. There might be some police in here that have been to the national academy. It's owned by was put on by the BSU, and the National Academy is for law enforcement and intelligence officials from all around the world to come for 10 weeks of very highly uh, uh, intensive, intense training. Uh, and so the BSU does that too. After that, I went back to, um, after doing that for eight years, frankly, you get a little burned out. Um, so I went back uh, and wanted to be a forensic examiner. But while I was at BAU, one of the things that they had asked me to do was, we all specialize in something, at pretty much at the, at the BAU. They asked me to look at hackers, can we profile hackers, can we profile insiders, and then can we profile? And when I say profile, what I'm talking about today is behavioral profile, right? Social demographics too, right? If I can get that out. Right? We start talking about language, and oh, it looks like there's Russian letters in here. We're talking Russians, they're different, you know, it comes from a, a certain socio demographic, or Chinese, or American. Uh, there are some indicators, so but when I say profiling, that's what I'm talking about. Um, um, when I say BAU, BAU, BSU, it's the same type of entity. But, so, one of the things that I had to do in trying to develop the ability to look at hackers um, is go back and look at how do we develop profiling in general uh, from a violent crime perspective. Um, what is it about the Behavioral Science Unit way back when, before the BAU, how are they able to develop the disciplines that they did? Um, because some of that, frankly, was lost. Some of that in the profilers. There's probably 45 profilers at any one time uh, there at BAU. But after that, I went back, uh, and the good thing about the FBI is if you do a fairly decent job of, of having a fairly strong work ethic, you can reinvent yourself, right? And so I had gotten into looking at or understanding a forensic crime scene or a forensic intrusion on some level, because like I said, what a profiler does is look at, look at a crime scene and, and assess behavior. So it's a very technical crime scene that all of you are experts at in some shape or form, right? So I had to understand that. I took a bunch of the end case classes, every network class I get my hands on. But I really was intrigued about learning more about the computer forensic side of it. So I went for the last five years uh, at the FBI, three years as an actual forensic examiner. That's what I did. Um, and I. Uh, finished up doing counterintelligence, espionage, and continuing with some of the certifications I had uh, to be able to uh, actually do some forensics in the field, not have to call on our computer forensic people, the CART, if you're familiar with computer analysis response team um, in the FBI. These are my uh, experiences today. Um, I can, it's actually, Kind of refreshing to be able to say that because usually you know in the FBI there are certain things that you can't talk about when you're a regular agent. So I don't want to. My caveat is that what I'm going to talk, be talking about today is my opinions, my experiences, which is why I'm going to slightly change the the, the the name of the slide. It's my experiences where profiling work, where it doesn't work. It doesn't always work, right? What I tell people all the time about profiles is it's not also that they don't work. It's there's too many false positives. Right? If I can find the right corpus of people, a thousand people, and I find the one serial killer, or the one insider, or the one hacker in there, good luck, right? But if I can find them, what do I do with the other 999? Because you might not know that, right? You might not know you have the one person. You, 
you created a subject list, right, a person of interest list, and your job is to kind of go down that list and figure out, and if the profile is valid, okay, that's great, but I have these people in here that, that don't have anything to do with it. And especially when it comes to the insider, if you walk away with nothing else today, there's such a stigma being attached, or is attached to somebody who's been under that scrutiny of having been an insider, that it can ruin lives and can ruin careers. So especially when it comes to the insider, we've got to be very, very good about compartmentalizing that scrutiny that we put on someone, realizing that we're always going to be fighting against the false positive. Hopefully that, that, that makes sense. So I love the cyber butterfly effect. I love the butterfly effect in general, right? Because we all want to think that we can capture every variable. And every variable, right, if we can measure it, will give us some ideas to causation on the other end. And we know the butterfly effect from chaos tells us that, that that's not necessarily that's not necessarily the case, right? We can't do it. However, a little bit of reading I've done on chaos theory does say that over time there are different patterns that come out, right? It's not always predictive, A, B, C, but there are patterns that come out, even in the butterfly effect, and in this combination of multivariable types of environments. From my opinion, based on my experience, right, a lot of these small mistakes, and you could argue that maybe they weren't really small mistakes in the in the long run, if they actually created very, very big effects, right? But a lot of these small effects were behavioral in nature. And across every case that I ever looked at, one of the things that, that, that I was extremely surprised at, maybe it's because I knew I was the best investigator ever at the FBI, this never affected me, which was far from the case, right? Is that most of the time when we do an assessment at the BAU on a case, and we don't get on planes, I was talking to a young lady, the other day, it's rare that we get on, I had it on the Gulf Stream, but it wasn't anywhere near as cool as the Criminal Minds television show, which is about where you're going to be, right? But usually, when we're involved in a case, we don't go to the crime scene. And the number one reason, or go to the intrusion. Changes a little bit if I'm dealing with an online type of threatening and a long-term type of intrusion, is because I turn on my investigator mentality, right? Which is good. Right? There's nothing I'm going to tell you today that a good investigator and good investigators out there are going to say, oh, I know this. All right? but, but you also turn on a bias when you turn on that investigator mode. Right? And so one of the things that we do at BAU is we don't want to be part of the crime scene. Right? We, want, we don't want to get involved because now we're like, who done it? And one of the things that we found in some of these small effects is often it had something to do with the investigation itself. Right? There was some investigator who knew for a fact that it was the sex offender right around the corner. But it wasn't the sex offender around the corner. It was the grandfather that had abused the child for three or four years, right? So those are the kind of, of small, I'd say small, right? Because they're biases. These biases that we have are small and they predetermine where we lead investigations. And it, 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 can, be, it can have really drastic consequences. And across all the cases that I worked, most of the time, the assessments that we gave at the end, because what happens is everything gets boxed up, you know, the golf stream, everything gets, gets boxed up and sent to the BAU, especially if it's a tr traditional crime, right? And then we have the investigators come in, and over a period of two or three days, they'll give us what they believe is an overall evaluation of the case. And we're going to follow a certain format when I throw these concepts out to you, right? And this is the format we use to try to reduce Try to reduce bias, but most of the time, these things are boxed up and, and, and sent back to us. Um, but across all of them, across all of them, a lot of times the recommendations that we had were with the investigation itself, right? Change your investigator. If you look this way in a certain, the very, very beginning, you really should have gone in, in this direction. The unknown offender profile, really, we don't do that often. We do it often. But because people get all jammed up and don't understand the false positives, right? And how do I deal with the false positives if I give them a profile? It becomes very, 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 very difficult to do. So, one of my mentors, I, I like to call him a mentor, but he was a giant in the BSU uh, back in the day um, that I could just pick his brain for hours. A guy named Ken Lanning. Anybody ever hear of Ken? He did a lot of. Uh, tough offense, child, child uh, molestation, child contact offenses. And he picked it up because nobody else wanted to do it. But when I asked Ken, who knows far more about profiling than I could ever know, I said, Ken, with all the cases you've looked at, right, 
across all different things. What are some of the, what's, can you give me a constant? And he told me, he told me one thing, and I'd like to start with that for today. And he said, this is what he said. People will believe what they want or need to believe in spite of all evidence and information to the contrary. Right? This is the primary tenet. This is Ken Lanning, what he told me. And I, I've seen that in every investigation. Right? So in your personal life, in your professional life, right? So what does this, what does this mean? I gave an example of the child offender. Right? It, a lot of times when you're doing a child offense, it has a lot to do with the, the incredible horrific coping mechanisms that have come up around a family and environment where a child's being abused for, for a certain amount of time. But how does it apply in the cyber world? Right? Same kind of thing. Your people you work for, yourself maybe, you've spent so much money on a lot of these appliances. It's one of the things I keep hearing today, right? You've spent so much money, you've got to justify this, your job is making a lot. You've got to believe that it's the best thing that you've ever done. Just do this, right? So if I start out thinking it's an external attacker, right, I'm going to look for information that reinforces that cognitive belief that I have. That it was external, or maybe it wasn't, or maybe it really isn't. Maybe it was somebody who used to work for the company that left. Um, so that is probably one of the most important things I want you to take away. Any off-grid statements? Is that something you're going to come up with today? No, like, but I hope there'll be other things. But really, think about it in your daily work streams, what you do. Next time you look at an investigation, um, is that make sure you have room for the contraindicators, right? For the other scenarios that are that are out there. Yeah, I know you've heard my next one, but I want to talk about it a little bit. Because I, I've heard a lot of people talk about this too, right? The second tenet of behavioral profiling, right? This is mine, this is what I would say, is the number one predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? Now, it doesn't mean always. Remember, we're talking about profiling, we're talking about probability. So it doesn't mean every time you hire a hacker, right, he's going to act out, right? But your risk, make no bones about it, your risk is elevated, right? And again, it's not just somebody who's been arrested, but that they actually do it, and I know intent is a legal term, but what was their motivation, right? Did they, did they really motivate, were they really motivated to do something wrong? Um, that's probably the most, most important thing. Now, one of the reasons profiling does work fairly well is with need-driven behavior. So generally, a lot of the stuff that we deal with is sexual paraphilia, paraphilia, right? Ways that people, their sexual behavior, it's, it's built in, it's in bake, it's baked in. So need-driven behavior, hackers, is there a need-driven behavior in, in hackers and insiders and the way they act? My belief is not always, right? Remember, Steve, you're talking about probabilities, right? But sometimes there is. And the interviews that I did when I interviewed them, I will touch upon one thing. What, this is what I found, right? This is what I found. And across a lot of offenses, right? People that challenge boundaries, especially guys, men, males, not always, right? But more males, I think, than women, have a need to thump on the world. Right? They have a need to thump on the world. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I saw that. And the other thing that I saw was poor self-esteem, relatively poor self-esteem. And we can talk about self-esteem all day. Nobody has perfect self-esteem, right? But what I saw, at least in my study, were individuals who very early on in life had some element of dysfunction. Right? Some, something was going on in their life. Now, no one, anybody have a perfect childhood, especially the ages of one through four? Anyone? We all have things that we deal with, right? But one of the things that I found was, at least something came out of the data when I was looking at it, was the fact that something happened early on in their life, and they turned to technology, right? It gave them some feeling of self-esteem, some feeling that they can thump on the world, that they can be successful. Now, there are a lot of people in here, I see a bunch of smiles, right, that are thinking, hey, that's me. You're talking about me. So the other thing I would say, again, not always, but the other thing that I thought was overrepresented, anybody statistical in here? A couple of people said it's overrepresented in the population, right? Overrepresented was that they also didn't have a very strong authority figure in their life to kind of keep them on the straight and narrow, right? They might not have, right? Or, the, or 
go to the other end. They had an incredibly dominating authority figure in their life, right? So, so that's one thing. So, so to me, it's not the same as a, a, a pedophile, a pedophile, or a pedophilia, and that kind of strong need. But there was some need to thump on the world. So what I would tell you is, if, you, if you're going to hire a hacker, you just got to measure the risk, right? And we use hacker, cracker, attacker, all in the same thing today. I apologize to the old school people in here, but that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. But realize your risk is elevated. If you don't believe that, go back to tenant number one. Does everybody remember what tenant number one is, right? People will believe what they want or need to believe, but like all the information there is contrary, because they're looking at it through their own lens, right? And it is. Does it mean you can't be successful? Right? doesn't mean they can't be productive members of society or your company, but you're just going to realize that you're going to have to have uh, an elevated risk. I would, I would say the same as people would ask me. I asked him back. I said, well, would you hire a sex offender, a child sex offender, to be your kid? Right? And they're like, oh, Steve, really? And that's when I my whole need-driven behavior. There might be a need to push boundaries, right? Um, not to form maybe in a, in a certain way. And I think most of us would say, no, I, I wouldn't, right? I'd be crazy. Steve, what, what, who do you think I am? Right, but so that's, that was my base from my experience. That's, that's certainly, um, that's certainly uh, what I saw. So how can we use this? Let's talk about the insider for, for a second, right? It's like what I believe, great questions have come my way over the last couple of days. Uh, in fact, a couple lovely young ladies over here earlier, I got to basically give my whole presentation to before, there they are, before we started, right? But, um, but the inside, right? The inside threat. This goes back to tenant number one. People go, what do you think about the inside? I actually think the inside for a lot of organizations is more dangerous than the external hacker. Because I don't think, for a lot of us, we're not on the radar of the external, the APT, the external hacker. There's some, Good arguments to that one is that uh, how much malware is out there now, malware is, it makes us all vulnerable to a certain extent, right? and I agree with that. But when it comes to the insider, the insider perspective, I think we, we all have that issue. And I also know we all have issues doing background investigations. Some of you work for organizations and you've been through incredible background organizations. But if you're not doing pre-hire interviews, you're doing something wrong, and people say, my wife tells me this. Well, we can't. I can't. I can't go out and you know we're, we could get sued if I go back to somebody's somebody's employer and say, hey, how was Steve? What was he a really good employer? Tell me a little bit about him. Um, and so I understand that that's difficult. So this is one thing I'll throw out there: the questions that you ask. If you're not doing a pre uh, pre hire interview, you got to be doing it. Let's talk about one of the best questions I found, and I'll liken it to polygraphs. And my course is the ace FBI agent for the FBI in my 20 years. I would ask on a normal occasion, especially a subject I was interviewing, probably a dozen, dozen and a half times, realistically, I'd say, what do you think of polygraph? Thank you for telling me the truth, what do you think of polygraph? Without a doubt, guess what they said? Yes. I mean, you know, there was one case I was working where it was pre-9-11, the guy who was coming in, we had his email, Right, we can get into that, but we had his email, we got a uh, source uh, that gave us his email, and he was going to a wedding. Well, if you know anything about terrorism, wedding is some type of a terrorist attack, right? So we go out to the airport, this always happens, 3 o'clock in the morning on Friday, Friday morning, we go out to Newark Airport, we pull to the side, and I ask him the question after dealing with this story just makes, makes any sense whatsoever, and I ask him, we take a polygraph. I mean, instantaneous, I couldn't even get graph out of my mouth. He goes, yes, I'll take a polygraph, right? So we call up, because we only have a certain amount of time, right? Because he's, he's not a US citizen, but he's in temporary uh, location there at the airport. We call up our profiler. Profiler comes up, because it's very important to get an Arabic speaking profile. This guy spoke English with Arabic. Profi uh, the uh, polygrapher went in there, and in 12 minutes, I think it was the fastest one, uh, he comes out and says, he blew ink all over the wall. Right? Not only has he been in Afghanistan, but he's in Afghanistan for a long time. Right, so that's, you gotta ask that question, right? I, every once in a while somebody will say, no, I really don't like to take a polygraph. And then, you don't know if it's just, it necessarily makes me guilty. It doesn't necessarily make me guilty, that's the other thing. But here's a better question, coming from polygraph. And this is what I would ask as part of your interview, right? If you're in human resources tomorrow doing an interview, 
for uh, pre-hire, right? You gonna take a polygraph? Yes. How do you think it's gonna turn out for you? Well, now I'm looking, now I'm looking for the waiver, right? I'm looking for somebody's locked in, yeah, it's a little late. Okay. All right, I think he's gonna talk to you. How do you think it's gonna turn out for you? And it just, it flips it on its side a little bit. So this is what I would say. Insider question should be asking all your, and I don't have to go back and actually talk to the employer, right? But insider, to see if they, number one predictor of future behaviors, past behavior. Hey, can we go back and talk to your employer? Sure, the employer, sure. If we do, how do you think it's gonna turn out for us? Right? Behaviorally based questions, and that kind of now, I see a couple of you going, okay, if I ever get that question again, I know exactly. Right, how to answer it, right? But so, but it's it's a great question. It's a behaviorally based question, something that you guys can can use tomorrow. Remember, and you, then you don't have to worry with legal about going out and saying, okay, I'm going to go back and what can we do? Um, so one question I, I throw out there. So, behavioral and cyber profiling purpose and key concepts. We're going to cover them very very quickly. So let's keep me on. So we're also talking about predatory behavior. So the other thing that I have to worry about is. Before lunch, predators eat lunch, right? So it's an issue. There's two types of profiling. There's proactive profiling, right? Where I'm trying to figure out who are the bad guys, who are the hackers, who are the insiders, right? So I can try to plan around them. And then there's reactive, right? Incident response in the context of an external attack or, or insider response. So there's two different types, proactive and, and, and reactive. Um, and then there's a couple of tenants. We really I would say a couple concepts. And one of the major concepts is, some people believe this and some people don't, is that something called behavioral homology, fancy term go at it, Quantico, behavioral homology. What it is is that your who you are is reflected in the things that you do. Right? I think some of us would say if I were to look at your computer, right, you'd say, yeah, I am obsessive impulsive. I have every file known to mankind in certain ways. Not always, not always. Right, but sometimes. So behavioral homology, that's one of the things about profiling that profilers will think about oh, behavioral homology. What you do, how you kill somebody, how you intrude, how you insider, how you act out, how you attack a predator, how you're a predator is reflected in, in what you do. Research is mixed when it comes to that, right? There's some good research and there's some good concepts. One book I would throw out, I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, is Sam Gosling, he's the University of Texas. He wrote a book called Snoop, which is a phenomenal book. Uh, it talks about how your stuff reflects who you are. And one of the things he talks about is for open mindedness is music, right? Your music taste. And so if I'm looking at somebody who thinks the best kind of all music is country and western, I gotta be careful because I know in the South, right? And there's no other type of there's no other type of music on their on their hard drive. Maybe more of a narrow minded, according to the work of Dr. Gosling. But sometimes behavioral homology works. The one that there is some research to support behavioral consistency. What that is saying, when I do things, I will do things a certain way every time I do them. We're generally, right? Things are going to change. We'll talk a little bit about signature here um, in a minute. So again, one of the things I think about, so I got the slide off of Momentum Partners. Uh, has anybody seen this slide before? These are all the different appliances that are out there. This is kind of my experience when I walked into Black Hat and went, uh, what, what's going on here? So, what can profiling add to this? I think it's a way to help you look at your security stack and the attack chain in a, in a new way. Let's talk about cyber profiling. This is my definition of it, somebody asked. Is it cyber profiling? I never heard of that. Is that a real term? It's my term. Right? I, I, again, I, you know, for being in the right place at the wrong time, wrong place at the right time, I don't know, but I, this is, this is how I would define it. So it's an assessment uh, from a behavioral investigative and forensic perspective. It's all three of those, behavioral, investigative, and forensic perspective. And when we're talking about cyber intrusion, right, or unauthorized access here, it's kind of looking at the behavior and is the behavior consistent with what the, technical, what the technicals are saying, right? So we don't go in the wrong direction. It's an insider, we're saying it's an external type of attacker. Or, we're gonna to get to a concept in a minute called staging in, in a mixed crime scene, which is important to look at. Um, but to provide an indication that attempts at attribution are focusing in a direction consistent with what is known about behavior. So please feel free, if this makes sense to you, we get the slides, please feel free to use it. 
know, I ask just if you could just source it, right? And that way, if it's wrong, you can blame me. Well, this guy came and, and, and you know, this is what he said the profiling was or cyber profiling was. So these are our traditional criminal profiling areas of focus that we look at, and the order is kind of important. One thing that's not on here is we usually start with a statistical analysis of what's going on in, in cyber in your vertical, right? What's going on in your vertical, in your industry, and what's going on in the, in the, in the broad perspective? We start there, right? Not who did it, right? Now, where's the, where's the malicious code? Where's the malware? Because now we go down that bias road. We start with, and so do this ahead of time, right? What I'm trying to say, do this ahead of time, because you all know when you know what is on the fan, spinning, right? It's very, very difficult. So let's, let's take a look at our statistics in our vertical, right? But if you do this ahead of time, and I think a lot of people are doing this, right? And so from a perspective of your stack, I'm talking about threat intelligence, right? All different threat intelligence type things out there. But look at everything else we got in the stack, right? If all you're doing is threat intelligence, you're not, you're not getting the entire picture. That's what I mean. Try to look at these concepts through the lens of, of predatory behavior and what that we at BAU have, have found to be Useful. The next one is probably the biggest thing, victimology. Right? A lot of it says the victim mindset, victimology, but if you were to tell me across the board, you can have one of these things, Steve, and nothing else, right? From a violent crime standpoint, serial homicide, or from a computer intrusion or insider, and if you can tell me everything, and it's a wish, right? If you can tell me everything about that, the victim, right? so everything about your network, how many times, what's your C-suite like, what's your hotspots, what's your, um, what looks like it's been put out on the web lately about you, what's on the dark web about your company, what's going on inside your company with regards to bonuses, with regards to hiring, uh, had you ever been hacked before? How did you react, right? How did you, how did you come out of that? How did you remediate? If you could tell me everything about that and nothing else, Right? That's all I want. If you, if you told me in my thought experiment, you know, it's just on one. That's what I would do. It's just victimology. And the reason is because what I found, at least from the violent crime stand standpoint, serial homicide. So for serial homicide, it, it also is first uh, victim control or initial contact. Where did that, where did that victim first come into to contact? Uh, and for you guys, it's where did the attacker first come into contact with your network? Right? Right? But if you could tell me everything, Usually, 95% of the time, violent crime, 5% of the time you're wrong, right? We do on probability here. 5% of the time you're wrong, 95% of the time there is not stranger on stranger violence, right? In some capacity, the offender specifically targets the victim. Now again, when it comes to cyber, it's a little bit more difficult because there is such uh, a, a, a voluminous type of malware uh, issue that's out there. But victimology, start with victimology. Do that now, if you use the CAD 20, right, computer audit guidelines 20, go through that. Where are we, right? Um, but start with victimology. Think to yourself, how am I a victim? How could I be a victim? And the other thing is, how are other people in my vertical, right, industry lives, how are, how are they? Because the key of victimology, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you something you don't know, don't be the low hanging fruit. Don't be the high risk victim, right? Be the low risk victim. If nothing else, if you have nothing else, when you're hit, you'll have a pretty good place to start, right? If you've done all this, if you've done as much as you can based on the resources that you have. The first thing that I'd say is beyond that is initial contact, where the initial contact happened, right? I'm dealing with a violent crime or whatever, and that, that goes with Knowing your posture, how to align, all the information that's about your company, Google your site, right? Google your company, finding out all those types of things. And then the next thing is victim control, right? Whenever I'm reading the paper and I see something, I want to know how was, and I, and I look at on violent crime, how was the victim controlled? Because it is, unless you're Batman or one of the Avengers characters or Superman, it's very, very hard to control a victim. And the same thing, the lateral, uh, lateral movement of um, um, uh, presentation that was given yesterday, right? You, I want you to think about your security stacks right now. How in your security stacks can you assess or ascertain how they would control your network? If you have nothing, you gotta get something, right? Whether it's a SIM or something like that, you gotta get something. 
But think about, again, this is the flow, this is what we used at BAU. Content analysis. A couple of cases I worked, I was interacting with the offender real time, thinking that he was actually, uh, he, uh, he was interacting with the target. Right? So the different tools that we use, we're looking at language. And language is a great, there's some automated content tools that are out there, looking at different language. Um, and especially when it comes to the insider, there's some work done and there's some value in looking at trying to ascertain disgruntlement in an organization. Because when it comes to the insider, we know one of the behavioral things is disgruntlement. Now, if you're going to profile everybody in your organization, depending on the size, that's disgruntled, wow, you're going to have a look, right? Everybody's disgruntled at different, different times. But looking at language can be very important, especially back in the day, especially even as soon as 2008, 2007. Sometimes in the middle of these types of cases, um, I'd be interacting with the offender, and I'm looking at his, his language. I'm looking at the number of I's he's using, the B's, the we's, qualifiers, retractors, language like that. And I'm trying to get a sense as to whether he's liking what I'm saying or if he's not liking what I'm saying. Because in this particular case, he had a million different accounts, PHI, personal health information, including people that had, had AIDS and other factors and stuff like that. And he threatened that if we didn't, thank God Bitcoin wasn't around back then, but if we didn't react and if we didn't give him what he wanted, um, he was gonna put all this stuff put all this stuff online, right? So we use content analysis, analysis also to talk about, I was talking to somebody before this about escalation. Are they escalating? Are they getting angry? Are they not getting angry? Victim disposal, right? If I'm from a violent, stand, violent crime standpoint, I'm talking about body disposal, right? But also, again, very, very broadly speaking, think about your security stacks and the attack chain. How are you measuring now that if you are attacked, how does that hacker Leave your network. What kind of DLP solution do you have? Digital rights management, right? What kind of third party? Uh, um, what kind of third party applications uh, that you have? Third party access to your networks. All that I would throw under victim disposal. Behavioral signature. So I know a lot. People in here know a lot about signature. This is how I think of signature, not technical signature. signature. But behavioral signature, if I talk about signature, you hear profilers, criminal minds, or whatever science of land talk about signature, I break it down into two things, and I challenge you to do the same thing when you're looking at any activity on your network. Modus operandi, that's what's needed to do the crime, right? What does somebody need to do to do the crime and get away without you finding them? That's MO. Everything else is ritual. Everything else is ritual, right? So I had to tie the victim up, but I didn't have to tie them up using 50 strands of chains and ropes, right? That's ritual. This person has a bondage issue, right? And so what I found in cyber is names of certain routines. If the code hasn't been shared, somebody pointed out one of those things, right? Depends on the code, right? If the code's been shared and everybody's got it, I don't care if it's a certain subroutine is named something specifically, anybody can use that code. But the names of certain codes, right? Subroutines and code, the timing of procedures, where the timing of procedure is not necessarily important, all these things can be indicative of ritual because remember, behavioral consistency is one of the things that, that we like, one of the things we like to talk about. We're gonna talk about typology and mixed crime scene here in a second and then wrap up and go to lunch. Where am I, going backwards. Right, so try to think of these things applying your Okay, let's go to type, let's go to typology. Typology, anybody familiar with this term? Typology, you probably heard about it. So if I've seen enough cases, um, if I've seen enough cases or looked at enough uh, of a certain type of offender, there's a certain way of globally looking at the characteristics to say, is this a sophisticated or an unsophisticated attacker, right? Is anybody, I think everybody's heard of that, right? When it comes to hackers at least. Sophisticated, unsophisticated is a good example of a typology. They don't always work, right? Different than taxonomy. Taxonomy, I just classify everyone. So typology is taking a look at an offender and looking at the overall characteristics of the offense. Does it fit in one jar or, or another? So these are some of the ones that you're probably very, very familiar with, or, or you might be familiar with, right? 
means of serial homicide, organized versus disorganized offender. Just to give you an example, so organized offenders. Organized offenders usually body disposal is the worst thing. Uh, you, you can't find them. You can't find the body. The body's not around. Why? Because they're organized, right? They want to do this and they want to do it again, right? So they're going to hide the body. Where a disorganized offender leaves the body wherever it is. So a disorganized offender usually, usually we're talking about somebody with a, psycho a, a psychotic issue, it's a, a psychosis, break with reality. Organized offender is a psychopath, right? Lack of empathy, right? But this is kind of how serial homicide. Uh, this is how the psychology works. From a child contact offense, we have a preferential offender. Ray and I were talking a little bit before the thing where we talked about a preferential offender versus a oppor opportunistic or situational offender. They behave certain ways. Your preferential offender is the offender that is the, again, not all, don't take this the wrong way, but they're the ones that generally will try to become a Boy Scout troop uh, leader, uh, maybe a pediatrician, maybe a teacher in a, in a younger kid's school, that type. They, they usually don't kill their victims, right? They usually uh, groom their victims. And so on the other hand, you have a situational or opportunistic offender that is just comes across a child and, and decides to do what they're gonna, they're gonna do. But depending on the overall characteristics, there are some, some behavioral characteristics that, that, that you might be able to infer. This is the one that I came up with the BAU, based on my knowledge, training, experience. And again, you can get this, I'll send it to you. Grab a card and I'll send it. Don't wait two two weeks. If it's something you want, I'll send it to you early. But what I found is sophisticated and unsophisticated. Nothing new there, right? Target specific versus target of, of opportunity, right? So I'm either specifically targeting APT, right? Let's say, or target of opportunity. I don't care who it is, right? I just want to get somebody, right? Those are two. So sometimes these are usually two or three axes, right? We just talked about one axis with preferential offender or whatever. This one I added, based on my experience of interviewing offenders, they certainly, they either wanted to avoid recognition or they wanted to gain recognition. So this is a three axis typology. It's not that complex, so I'll just let come out. And the example of a red star, right, would be, red star, maybe, maybe advanced persistent threat, right, target specific. They want to avoid recognition, sophisticated, whereas somebody like a script kid, unsophisticated target of opportunity, gain recognition. Very simple, right? Anything off speed, it's never that simple. But as you're trying to critique your investigations and you're trying to critique what you do and how you think about it, I challenge you to maybe try to fit it into a typology. And this is where I think it's important to wrap up. Mixed crime scene. How many have heard of a mixed crime scene before? So a mixed crime scene, here's our typology. And a mixed crime scene is for some reason or other, my stars aren't showing up. So a mixed crime scene is a crime scene where when I look at it from a typology standpoint, it's all over the place, right? It doesn't fit in one neat little box. Now, every case is almost like that, right? You have some element of sophisticated, unsophisticated. But generally, when I'm looking at a mixed crime scene, there's two things that are possible. One is inexperience. For that. The other thing is I have more than one attacker. And if you walk away, the other thing was something outside of this. Walk away with a mixed crime scene, right? Think about it. Because some of the hacks that we've experienced over the last couple of years, my personal belief is some of the stuff that we're seeing over the last couple of months, without going into detail about it, that's something in the political arena, are mixed crime scenes, right? The reason we're confused is because everybody's been in there, right? Or they've been a High risk victims to a lot of people. A lot of people have been in there, right? But as investigators, we go, oh, oh look, I found them all where. It's this. And it goes back to the Russians. It goes back to the Chinese. But there could be an insider that times it a certain way so that it coincides with what's going on. Um, it could be a hacker group, right? Um, it could be a lot of different things. And our bias is just to look for that one thing, right? We look for that one thing. I got it. I have the golden ticket, right? Um, and it's not always like that. So think about a mixed. Mixed crime scenes, because we would deal with it all the time. Think youthful offender or inexperienced, right? And the other way we look at it is um, more than one attack, right? And Sony, for example. And, and, and having interviewed these guys, you guys have a lot of experience and you know this, all uh, reiterated. They all trade in information on the dark web, even years ago, right? Because they all think I'm coming through the door, not me personally, but they think somebody's coming through the door. And when it happens, they want information to trade. They want to barter. 
right? So they're all finding out about vulnerabilities and other places. We, and we saw the other uh, uh, um, presentation earlier today. It talks about they're collaborating, right? Of course they're collaborating. They know where this stuff comes from. Not always, but some of them, right? And so once they find out, right, hey, this, this network is hacked. They're in there. Because the other thing is, again, this might be happening. I don't see a lot of networks are so diverse now. It used to be the hackers going to patch because they don't want anybody else to get in. That's a full-time job, right? You know, hackers going to penetrate your network and then patch everything, all the vulnerabilities, so nobody else gets in there. I don't see that as much anymore. Please come to the scene. You're all, you know, you're, you're wrong. I see it all the time, right? But they trade in information. They trade in information. So a lot of times you might be dealing with a mixed crime scene, right? Oh, my stars came up. All right. All right. Who's messing with me? It's one of you, one of you guys out there. Um, touch on one thing real quick, and really, this is the last slide. We'll go to lunch. So, uh, you know, there's so much to learn, right? So, one of the things we do at BAU is try to figure out the issue: is how, do, how do adults learn? And so, one thing I would I would throw out to you is, and this is what I use: is that I call it insider risk threat program, but I call it the employee life cycle. Sometimes pathways, and we could talk about pathways for an hour, right? Pathways to violence, pathways to attack, which we're not even getting into. But sometimes this is a real easy way to think about at least the insider, right? We have somebody we hire, we already talked about something we're going to be hiring. Uh, the employee, they're, they're part of your, your organization, your employee. And then when you exit or termination, all the like NIST 853 revision four, the CERT best practices guidelines for insider, all this stuff, it's very hard to get your hands around. Right? Put it on something simple like a pathway. This is really very easily conceptually to understand and use. And again, if you have any questions on this, how to weaponize it, unweaponize it, defend yourself, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you have my information there. I'll have some cards out. Um, there's my phone number. Somebody's going to hack me. But there's my phone number. Um, and there's my email, and um, if you need the presentation ahead of time, um, feel free to um, send me an email, I'll send it to you. And also, on my Dropbox, I don't have a website, I'm a Dropbox guy, I put things up there periodically that you might, you might want to look at. Um, and this PDF, the initial version of it, is on my Grab My Business Card, and you can go to that Dropbox public folder, don't hack it, please. But you'll find that PDF is, uh, this PDF is up there so you can get it ASAP. All right, please stay in touch. Give me whatever feedback. If there's any way I can help you, give me a call. Um, and thank you for your patience. How did I do?